Well, welcome. In this video, we're going to be looking at what's called normal curves and normal distributions. Now, in the previous uh, unit, we talked about binomial distributions. And you're going to see above here that we're going to make a connection between uh, the last unit, the last chapter, and this one. So in the last chapter, we saw graphs like the one above me, where we looked at a distribution of data, and where the, and, and in these situations, we have the uh, probability of a success being set constant as 0.5. So remember, when that happens, it's going to be symmetrical. And the more, what this, these graphs above me are illustrating is that the more number of trials, as the number of trials increases, that what happens with that data is it becomes more of like a bell-shaped curve. Um, or what we call a normal curve. And that's what we're going to be looking at. So in this unit, we're going to be looking at larger distributions of data. As that distribution of data gets closer and closer to infinity, what happens to the shape of that graph? And that's going to be the shape of a normal curve. So in this unit, in a lot of these sections, there's going to be a lot of writing, and this, this one included. So you're going to want to, as you're watching the vi videos, pause the videos and write down the notes and that way you can get them and, and then follow along. Otherwise, if you're trying to write them down as I'm walking through it, um, you are not you might miss some things. So please, as we're going through each of these pages, write down the notes and then, uh, so pause the video and then hit play as you're ready to move on and listen to what I'm going to refer to or what I'm going to talk about uh, from that information. So let's go ahead and start and look at what the graph of a normal curve looks at and some of the properties of a normal curve. Okay, so here's the graph of a normal curve. And the parent function for this graph, the parent function is what we have here, the f of x equals e to the negative x squared. And we're going to be talking about some of these properties as we go down below here, so I'm not going to refer to some of these um, terms right now. But normal models are appropriate for distributions whose shapes are what we call unimodal. Sounds like a weird word there. But if you look at the prefix there, uni means one, and modal, you can, from the sounds of it, you can guess it means mode. So unimodal is where there's one mode. And if the graph is roughly symmetric, then it's going to be a normal distribution or normal model. So what are some properties? Well, one of the first properties is that the domain of this function is all real numbers, and the range does not include zero, but it's greater than zero and less than or equal to one. So the range of the data is a, so it's greater than 0, but less than or equal to 1. The maximum value is always going to be 1, and that's going to occur when x is 0. So in the middle here, when x is 0, our maximum value would be 1. It's an even function. If you remember from what we talked about earlier this year, in the first semester, we talked about even functions. Even functions are where they're reflected over the y-axis. So that is the case here. So this is an even function. So that tells us the y-axis is a line of symmetry. Now for this next property, what this is saying is that as the limit of the function approaches a positive infinity, so when we go in the, as we look at this graph in the direction of positive infinity, it gets closer and closer to 0. And as the limit approaches negative infinity, it's approaching 0 as well. So as we go in the negative direction, it's also approaching 0. So what that tells us is the x-axis is an asymptote of the graph. Now let's look at this next property. This next property tells us that near the y-intercept, at the top of the graph, the graph is curved downward. So we call it concave down. And further away from the y-axis, the graph is curved upward. We call that concave up. Let's go back to our graph. So when I look at this curve down, so at the top part, we say it's curved downwards. It looks kind of like a frown. So we say it's curved downwards. At the bottom of the graph, you can see it's curving upwards. And that's on both sides. It's, so it's concave up, and the other one is concave down. Now, the point where it changes from being concave downwards to concave upwards and vice versa, we call that the inflection point. And then that's going to happen at 1 over square root of 2. They also have it here as e to the negative 1 half power. Or, another way to look at that, if I scroll down here, 1 over square root of 2 and negative 1 over square root of 2 is the same as plus or minus, if we were to rationalize the denominator, would be the same as the square root of 2 over 2. So that's where the graph changes its concavity. 
Here's some more information to make sure you understand. The normal, the standard normal curve is an offspring of the parent's normal curve that we had before. So some properties for the standard normal curve is that it de depicts the probability distribution of a standard distribution. That's where we have a distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. These have inflection points then. Instead of at square root of 2 over 2 and negative square root of 2 over 2, it's at 1 and negative 1. And the area between the curve and the x-axis is one square unit. Now, we have what's called a 68-95-99.7 rule, which if you want to write this down, you can. Otherwise, looking at this graph describes what we're talking about here. Now, the reason why it's called the 68-95-99.7 rule is that 68% of the values are going to fall within one standard deviation of the mean. So that means 68% of the data would be inside this part of the graph. It's kind of a blue section here. 95% of the data fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So that means two standard deviations above and below the mean here. So 95% of the data is inside this region. That means 99.7% or almost all the data is going to be within three standard deviations of the mean. Now if you notice I have some other percentages here that are highlighted. You want to make sure that you memorize these highlighted pieces of information and you'll see why when we get to a story problem. But Now how do I get this information? This 34% represents in that first standard deviation, just the standard deviation to the, that's greater than your average, so just to the right of center. How would we get that? Well, if we have 68% of data is between one standard deviation both above and below the average, half of that would be 34%. So that means 34% of it is just one standard deviation greater than our average. Now this next piece referring to the area that would just be the section. It's kind of a, I don't know what color that would be, kind of a pur light purple. That section there represents 13.5% of your data. How do we get that? Well, if we take 95% or 95% of our data, that whole section, and subtract from it the 68%, what that's going to do is that's going to give us both of these purple sections. And if I take half of that, that would just give me just one of those purple sections. So just one of those purple sections is 13.5% of the data. Now in this small little sliver, in this small little orange sliver, referring to the rest of the data, even beyond this three uh, standard deviations, if I want to figure out how much is left in the rest of the data, well, I would take 100% of the data minus the 95% that we had in the previous section and divide that in half to get just what's left on this side. And so in that sliver, there's going to be 2.5% of the data. If I take 2.5 plus 13.5 plus 34%, I'm going to add those together, I'd get 50%. So that means half of my data is to the right of my average, the other half is to the left of my average. How is that useful to us? Let's look at this example. With an average height of 184 centimeters, Dutch males are among the tallest in the world. If a normal model is appropriate, and the standard deviation for height is about 8 centimeters, what percentage of Dutch men are over 2 meters tall? Now, first off, when it says if a normal model is appropriate, that means that we can use this normal curve. Now, you've got to be careful with this one because notice how everything here is in centimeters until we get to the question. It says what percentage of Dutch men are over 2 meters tall. Well, the first thing I have to do is I have to convert that. So there's 100 centimeters in a meter, so 2 meters would be 200 centimeters. So when they say what percent are greater or are over 2 meters tall, we're referring to greater than 200 centimeters. And remember, a normal model is appropriate, so we could draw our normal curve. We put a line down the middle to represent the middle set of the data, so in the average. So we know the average height is 184 centimeters. So we put that in the middle. Now, we also know the standard deviation is 8 centimeters. So I'm going to draw my line to represent my first standard deviation. And I'm going to take and add together 148 plus 8. And when I do that, I get 192. So 192 is eight, within 8 standard deviations of our mean. That means our second standard deviation, I would take and draw another line here. And that represents 192 plus 8. 
And 192 plus 8 would be obviously 200. Now the question says what percentage of Dutch men are over 200 centimeters tall? So we're trying to figure out what percentage of information this would represent. Well, we know that that represents 2.5% of our data. So that's why we need to memorize those percentages. Let's look at another one. Suppose it takes you 20 minutes on average to drive to school with a standard deviation of 2 minutes, and a normal model is appropriate. How often will you arrive at school in less than 22 minutes? Well, since a normal model is appropriate, we can draw our normal curve with a line down the middle to represent the average. So the average here is a 20 minute drive. So I want to draw my line now for my first standard deviation. My first standard deviation is going to be, it's my standard deviation is 2 minutes, so that means above my mean would be 20 plus 2, so that would give me 22. My other standard deviation above my mean would be 2 more, so that would be 24. Now I could also put standard deviations less than the 20. So that first one less than 20 would be subtracting 2, so that would be 18, and another subtract 2 would be 16. So now the question says, how often will we arrive at school in less than 22 minutes? So I'm trying to find the percentage that would fit under that part of my curve. Now we know that half my data is on one side of that line, so that represents 50% 50 50 of my data. So that means that other section, if we refer back to those percentages, represents 34% of my data. So if I add those together, I get 84%. Now the next question says, how often will it take you more than 24 minutes? Well, more than 24 minutes is that little section there, so that answer is going to be 2.5%. Do you think the distribution of driving times is unimodal, unimodal and symmetric? Yes, because it is only having one mode, and it is symmetric. So, yes, it is unimodal and symmetric. Well, that's it. That, are, that is our notes for this first section about a normal curve. So hopefully now you understand how to apply those percentages because you want to have those percentages memorized in order for you to be successful in your assignment. So with that, good, good luck now as you work on your homework.